It's 1,451 feet, 1,727 if you count the antenna. Funny thing, you know we don't get to count the antenna. Here's how it goes. The Council on Tall Buildings who gives out the award, they look at it this way. If an architect puts a spire on top of a building, well, you know that's organic, that's designed, so you measure it. An antenna being in an add-on wouldn't really count. And there's still some discussion if they're going to start counting antennas in the future. Well, we didn't need it. 1,451 feet of pure building, tallest in the world for 22 years. The construction technique is called the bundled tube system. Consider the building like a bundle of sticks wrapped together for strength. It consists of nine, number nine, contiguous steel tubes, each is 75 foot square. Two stop at 50 floors, two go up to 66, three go up to 90, the final two 110 stories. With, of course, that observation deck you can gaze down and get sick in on floor 103. Now, why terminate the different sections? This is strategic. You are in the Windy City. And although the Windy City nickname was given to us by a New York Sun newspaper man because we wouldn't shut up about how we should host the World's Fair, it is a Windy City with 81 mile an hour wind shear effect. Now, personally, I look at my Sears Tower and I start thinking about the great Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu writing in the Tao Te Ching so many, many years ago. Can one yield and overcome? Can you learn to bend and yet remain straight? And I say, hey, the Sears Tower is following the Tao. For do you realize this building has the ability to bend and remain straight? Gale force winds won't topple that building. It's flexible, can sway like a leaf three feet left to right. If you're up there in a big windstorm, you'll be safe but dizzy. Hey, you know we lost the tallest building title in 1996, Petronas Towers, Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Here's the thing, they were shorter than the Sears Tower on floor, so they used the Spire Trick 25 feet, that made them 1,483 feet. 2005, Taipei 101 Taiwan reaches 1,671 feet. 2007, everything heads over to the United Arab Emirates, Dubai. The Burj Dubai reaches 2,400 feet. 2010, the Burj Dubai is renamed the Burj Khalifa of Dubai. They have to get all new t-shirts in the gift shop and they add extra height. The tallest building in the world today, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai, which by the way was in the Tom Cruise Mission Impossible movie, it's 2,717 feet. It's not in Chicago. <laughs> do not fret and do not cry. Who is the architect of the Burj Khalifa of Dubai? You know where I'm going with this. Chicago guy. Adrian Smith that did the Trump Hotel and the NBC Tower was the architect of the tallest building in the world, the Burj Khalifa of Dubai. Look all the way over to the right now. We see an aluminum statue on the horizon. That is Ceres, the Roman goddess of Grain, where we get the word cereal from in English, she's perched atop the Art Deco Chicago Board of Trade from 1930. It's 605 feet, that was the tallest building in Chicago for 25 years. In fact, the sculptor John Storrs never gave the statue a face. Who would see it way up there was the common thinking. But actually, Art Deco statues don't have faces. And you know what? You know this even if you don't know that you know this. Because a very famous Art Deco statue is Oscar, the Academy Award, right? No features. And who makes the Oscars for Hollywood? Chicago, of course, they're still manufactured right here. Now in 1980, a world-class architect from Germany, Helmut Jahn, would add an annex to the Board of Trade. It will be in the postmodern style. The postmodernists reacted to the modern movement. After Mies van der Pastan in 69, you had so many imitators, people got bored with glass boxes. The postmodernists said, you know what? Enough with your abstract boxes. You're giving us a headache. We want to look like something again. So what happens in postmodernism? They reinterpret history. They reach into the past for design ideas, but they don't give up modern materials. Look how Jan recapitulates the original pyramid roof from the Art Deco 30s, dramatic setback sculpture on the training floor, but he does it with modern materials. Take your thumb and forefinger, isolate the annex alone. I call this Jungian synchronicity. Isn't it curious how the annex looks very much like a hood ornament from the automobiles of the 1920s, which was the heyday of Art Deco. We're constantly fighting entropy in Chicago. All systems want to date, lay down and rest have to wake our bridges up, love the Congress Parkway. Two years in the making, an extreme makeover. It would be so great if every bridge up the Chicago River could look like that. Ah, the pink tower in front of the Sears Tower, 311 South Walker, Cohen, Pedersen, Fox. This is postmodernism once again. It's a style called castellated gothic. It's most distinctive feature. Look above the crenellations of the crown. That is a 10-story high drum of glass. There are close to 2,000 fluorescent lamps inside. Now when it is illuminated late at night, you will hear Chicagoans call this building the White Castle. Did we give it that nickname? Because we're longing for some 
Game of Thrones, Medieval Age Pass. No, we call it the White Castle because we're longing for sliders, White Castle hamburgers. If you see this book, Butter Building lit up at night, it looks very much like a giant White Castle hamburger joint, that rather famous Midwestern chain with a neo-Gothic facade. But let me be clear, when I compare this building to the hamburger joint, I'm not trying to make some lame tour guide joke, there's a connection. The White Castle restaurant and 311 South Wacker share the same inspiration. They were both actually modeled after one of the few buildings which predate the great Chicago fire you can see downtown. At the corner of Chicago and Michigan Avenue, there's a little visitor center for you. It's called the Water Tower. Little Yellow Castle was a standpipe for the water pumping station in 1869. 1871, the fire wipes out that entire north side. The water tower remains unscathed to become a symbol of Chicago's spirit. Hey, gaze at the Sears Tower one more time, friends, and imagine you are French. Your name, Alain Robert, but the world calls you Spider-Man. Alain Robert, the French daredevil, August 1999, like a little monkey. In two hours, he climbed the Sears Tower. Arrested on the roof for criminal trespass and performing an aerial show without using a net. So after that, it was the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco, Paris Eiffel Tower, Petronas Towers, Kuala Lumpur, Taipei 101. Pushing 50 years of age, last spring he was swinging on the spire above the Burj Khalifa in Dubai. Consider the mind of building climber Alain Robert, how he views the universe, because what is architecture if it is not the way that we interact with the space we live in, that we inhabit? You or I look at a building, we say beauty. Perhaps we say function, the uses we put it to. Alain Robert looks at the same building and says, cool, a new obstacle to help me overcome my fear of heights. He suffers from vertigo, that's why he climbs. He's getting over it. It's taken 45 years. Should we all climb a tall building like Mr. Robert? No, of course not. I would, however, suggest that it never hurts to look at the universe with new eyes. I learned to think this way from a man who always said universe when he was riding spaceship Earth. He seemed to be a verb when he took a truncated icosahedron using one of the strongest structures in nature, the four-sided triangle known as a tetrahedron, and gave us the geodesic dome like the one they have at Disney World. I was in Reno, Nevada a week and a half ago viewing his Dymaxion car from the World's Fair here of 1933. I'm speaking of architect, philosopher, inventor Buckminster Fuller. Now if you don't remember the work of Bucky Fuller, look him up tonight when you get home and then turn in your papers to me tomorrow by 11 a.m. All right, if that's too quick for that assignment, I'll give you an alternative. On your own time, go out and see the brand new documentary on my favorite London architect, Norman Foster. The name of this new documentary is How Much Does Your Building Weigh, Mr. Foster? Now, who would ask an architect a question like that and blow his mind about the use of materials? Bucky Fuller. On our right, what an engineering marvel, the Chicago, former Chicago Mercantile Exchange Center. Loved the serrated corners, which allowed them to double the corner offices, made so many more people feel important. Here's why this building is an engineering marvel. The 240 store office towers originally housed a 40,000 square foot column free trading floor. Those ceiling struts supported by the load bearing walls on either end, that might have been okay, until they increased the office space by cantilevering the top 34 stories out. All that extra space meant weight bearing down so much, had they attempted to pour those towers straight, natural shifting would occur and they would tilt in. So during the building phase, Alfred Pineshian Company, structural engineering firm, they have to make a change. They pull the floor plates out one eighth inch from ground to midpoint. And then you reverse that process, you push them back in. They're bowed out like a giant version of that great toy game. And what happens now? Natural shifting occurs, the building realigns on its own, it's absolutely plumbed. Let's take a closer look at the Civic Opera Building. We do find a little bit of detail here with uh, Native American motifs above the windows. You find that in American Art Deco. It's in theater after all, comedy and tragedy mass. It's not Civic Opera, but building, by the way. That's not a misprint, uh, just a popular typeface of the 20s, like there was a bias against the letter U. You always see them replacing it with the V. Lean back with its surrounding towers. Indeed, it looks like a giant armchair. That would earn its nickname in 1928, Insul's Throne. The man who commissioned this building, Samuel Insul, was the king of electricity. He put everyone in the Midwest on the power grid. Now Insul's Throne is facing west. It's turning its back on the east. Why? Well, some tour guides would claim because of Sam's daughter, an opera singer. She had auditioned for the New Yorker. Sometimes you hear the story that it was his mistress. Either way, somebody in his family auditioned for the New York Opera. They turned her down. Sam got so mad, he built an entire building like a chair so he could turn his back on New York City. And that, my friends, I would call a story. I would not believe a word of that story, but tour guides just love to tell it. 
Yes, Art Deco looks like a chair. There's a physical reason behind it. We'll talk about it later. Right now, we approach Randolph Street. Sometimes I like to send people beyond the boat. Photographers, take a walk west four blocks to the corner of Randolph at Des Plaines later, and you can take a picture of Mary Braga's sculpture out there, which actually commemorates the most famous labor event in the history of America. It happened in Chicago on May 4th, 1886. It was called the Haymarket Affair. The labor activists in Chicago led the fight in America for the eight-hour workday. Two workers killed McCormick Reaper work strike the night before. Next night, city sanctioned protest out at the Haymarket. The mayor of Chicago, Carter Harrison, goes to the rally. He calls it tame. He advises Captain Bonfield of the Chicago Police to keep an eye on things and let it die down. Instead, as the mayor leaves riding his big white horse home towards Ashland Avenue, Bonfield sends 175 armed policemen in to give the bums rush to the protesting workers and some loose cannon lobs a bomb into the crowd. Shooting commences in all directions and when it's over, policemen and civilians lie dead. It was a tragedy. But what happened the very next day was called a travesty of justice by the lawyer Clarence Darrow. You see, the problem is, to this day, no one knows what really happened at the Haymarket. It didn't matter. They were looking to blame somebody. They rounded up all the speakers from the rally, and without a shred of evidence, four men would hang. Three were sentenced to life in prison, another committing suicide in jail. They became known as Chicago's Haymarket Martyrs, and they're still remembered by the labor holiday, which although was founded right here in America, I guess you would say it's celebrated in other countries. That's that one they call May Day. Now we leave the 1800s history behind us, returning to the present, just like in art, we have a trip tip. Three buildings by Cone, Peterson, and Fox. On the corner, the 2004 building makes a nice reference to the clock tower, the Boeing building across the river, with a translucent square at the very top. Their middle building, 333 West Wacker Drive, is probably their most celebrated. Everything about it is about the Chicago River. The arc mimics a bend we take with the boat, the glass behind those bullnoses reflects architectural and skyline, nautical symbols on the lobby housing the mechanicals, and then there's an octagonal support column there. Where's that reference? Look across to the corners of the merchandise mart. They're reflecting that. Go back to the nautical circle, find it become a window motif on 225 West Walker. Same architectural firm, very different style. If you get a picture here, you have almost a textbook example of, of a firm transitioning from modernism to postmodernism. Now, I won't call that middle building purely modern, not with that granite lobby double coating going on, but it's leaning towards a minimalist approach. 225, six years later, fully blown into the postmodern period. Hey, I don't want to miss on our left the heads along the bank of the merchandise mart, which David Letterman once called the Pez Hall of Fame. Well, they're not candy dispensers, they are merchant princes. Go up there and you'll find F.W. Woolworth, A. Montgomery Ward, Marshall Field, Julius Rosenwald, Robert Wood of Sears, Edward Filene of Filene's Bargain Basement, John Wanamaker, who came up the department store as a concept, and last but not least, Mr. A. Hartford, who started the A&P grocery store chain. A&P, of course, the name of that store, as well as the name of that wonderful short story set in an A&P by the writer John Updike. I would like to acknowledge on the right now, Wacker Drive, the world's first bi-level roadway, conceived by Burnham, completed by his co-author Edward Bennett, and Charles Wacker, first head of the Chicago Plan Commission. See how we use every inch of space in Chicago. We're not going up and up and up with skyscrapers, we split the traffic in two. So the upper level of Wacker Drive takes you through the city with a work road underneath. Now over the last 10 years, Part of the Urban Waterways Design Project is to create a river walk. So Walker Drive was picked up, it was shifted back, we started with flower boxes and benches, and now you're going to start seeing cafes come in. One day I'll invite you to join me and we'll eat and drink our way from Lake Michigan at every cafe along the river and they'll expand all the way back to the Sears Tower. Daniel Burnham would be proud. Hey, look at the Builders Building on your right, 1927. Note the addition from 1986. One change, bay windows will let in more light. And you know what? The need to make sure that you got light and fresh air to the streets of Chicago, that's the truth of why Art Deco looks like a giant chair. The rise of the early skyscrapers blocked out the fresh air and sunlight, creating in the streets a germ incubator. So to air the streets out, by 1923, you were under height-restrictive ordinance. One-fourth of a building could rise higher than 260 feet. You had to cut the rest of the property below that. Ah, the LaSalle Wacker building on the right, Holerburn Root. That's an Art Deco style. See how they do that? They do that in that way they make uh, they have kind of a light well and air coming down. Now the half-finished building on the right, I'm thinking of getting some planters for this one. I don't know what else to do with it. Um, this was supposed to be an 1,100-foot skyscraper, a hotel condominium project called the Waterview Tower in Shangri-La Hotel. They ran out of funding. But I have heard, I heard a radio interview the other day, there's a Chicago developer trying to resurrect it as a 65-story condo. 
Look to you right now, this building that looks like a stretched out hollow Greek temple, like a leftover set piece from Xena Warrior Prince Princess, is today home to United Airlines. It comes to us in 1992 from Spanish architect Ricardo Bofil of Taller Architecture. He's kind of a modern classicist with this postmodern building. He merges a Greek temple style roof, pilasters like Greek columns with a glass curtain wall of modernism. Next door, 55 West Wacker Drive. I have but one word for that building, it's architectural style. Brutalism, and that's enough. Let's move on quickly. 35 West Wacker Drive. Coming up next is home to our largest advertising firm, the Leo Burnett Company. Irish architect Kevin Roche with this postmodern 1989 building is thinking about Lewis Sullivan. Chicago school ideal, right? Building as Greek column, base, shaft, and capital. Now there's a bit of a prairie school reference worked in. Just take the top of the building. You've got overhanging eaves and those horizontal lines. If you took the top of that building down, you put it on a green lawn, you'd have a Frank Lloyd Wright residential house. By the way, Frank Lloyd Wright's Roby House is a tour you can do in Chicago. Now, this beautiful little park coming up on our right is our Illinois-Vietnam War Veterans Memorial and Wall. It truly has become a favorite of Chicagoans, and it really shows the potential of what we can do with the River Wall. What should the Chicago River look like? This is what the Chicago River should look like right here. Now, you see the dark green Art Deco building up there that looks like a giant bottle of champagne, yeah? That's the Hard Rock Hotel. The champagne design might have been intentional. Today it's the Hard Rock Hotel, but it dates back to Prohibition. It was a Union Carbide and Carbon Company. Maybe the Burnham Brothers were giving a editorial comment on the era. Behind it with the Chevron roof, two Prudential Plaza, postmodern Art Deco inspired by New York's Chrysler Building. And the tubular white building beyond them, rapidly disappearing, was the Aeon Center at 1136 feet, third tallest building in Chicago. Like a rocket ship about to take off, the skinniest skyscraper in Chicago, 75 East Wacker Drive, coming up on our right, only nine and a half foot across that octagonal crown. It is clad with terracotta, which was so popular after the Great Chicago Fire because being fired clay meant fireproof. Now, artistically, Charles Beersman, the architect of the Wrigley Building, he uses terracotta like an artist. Ever watch an artist at the canvas? In addition to your brushes, often you will have rags. The key to great painting sometimes is in your shading technique, unless you're doing obviously in flat colors like op art or pop art. And in this case, look how Beersman gets a three-dimensional shading technique with the clock tower of the Wrigley Building by having the terracotta tiles baked in six different colors. It's subtle, but they go from a blue white to a creamier white at the top. I think it makes it a little more interesting to the eye. Two buildings of note at the south end of the DuSable Bridge with concave face. The London Guarantee Building would join with 333 North Mish as they occupy the site that was Fort Dearborn, 1803 westernmost United States military outposts. The fort, by the way, is one of the four red stars on the Chicago flag flying from the DuSable Bridge. The meaning of the flag of Chicago. The top blue bar, Chicago River North Branch, Lake Michigan. Bottom blue bar, Chicago River South Branch, Sanitarian Ship, Ship Canal. Three white stripes, the sides of the city. There's a north side, a south side, a west side. We don't think about an east side. Well, except for the 10th Ward, somebody put a lake over there. The four red stars, 1803 Fort Dearborn, 1871 Great Chicago Fire, 1893 Columbia Exposition World's Fair, 1933 the Century of Progress World's Fair, also held in Chicago. Hey, find an older gentleman who actually came to the 1933 World's Fair. Say, what do you remember, sir? You know, we probably won't say Bucky Fuller's Dimaxian car. He probably will say, Sally ran the fan dance who showed up in Chicago, wrapped up in two swan feather fans, wearing nothing more than slippers on her feet. Oh my. And everybody said her dance made the fair worth attending. Now some people were disturbed by Sally's shenanigans. They took her to court. The Chicago judge threw the case out, commenting, yes, well, a lot of people probably like to put pants on horses. Case dismissed. NBC Tower, the building that reminds you of 30 Rock in New York, comes to us from Adrian Smith, 1989, postmodern Art Deco. University of Chicago Downtown Business Center, Gleitzer Center is on our right. It has a neo-Gothic facade, a reference to the University of Chicago's Hyde Park campus. And look in the distance from this perspective at Big John, the John Hancock Center. Most Chicago of our skyscrapers, Bruce Graham, Dr. Fosler Khan, 1969. Please make sure you see the Hancock Center from its base on Michigan Avenue. Its distinctive tapering profile, not unlike the Washington monument or an Egyptian obelisk, it carries you up even when your feet are on the ground. To really go up though, use the elevator, it's easier. Visit the 94th floor observation deck, or the real treat, go to the 95th floor restaurant, the signature room restaurant and lounge, where the best view of Chicago is a floor to ceiling window inside the ladies restroom. So ladies, you get to check that out. By the way, that's no story. I have had that verified by 376 ladies on this very tour boat.
and I sometimes tend to go the extra mile for you. So I can tell you, yes, it is the absolute best view. On our right now, we passed Illinois Center, huge air rights project. Mies van der started 1967. Harry Weiss of the River Cottages that we saw added the triangular Swiss Hotel, causing a gentleman from London to ask me, did you, Mr. Harry Weiss, give the Swiss Hotel that triangular design? Was he conscious his building would look like a giant Swiss Toblerone chocolate bar? <laughs> well, no, I don't think he was thinking about the candy. Let's just call that synchronicity. Architecture never happens in a vacuum. By using a triangular design on this site, before Lakeshore East condos were underway, he afforded the most surface area possible lake views. The hotel on your left is the Sheraton Hotel in town. Hour. Cordwell Solomon Binns, 1992, referencing the Chicago school style of the 1800s. It will join with city front place rentals and these uh, luxury condos called Riverview One and Do, what is called collectively city front center. I love by the 1980s urban planners woke up. They got it. They pushed cars away and then left the river for the people. So people, Chicagoans and visitors could come together and maybe have, I don't know, I think the poet Joseph Brodsky probably said it best, private moments in public spaces. And your centerpiece is the beautiful Centennial Fountain. Now there's a water cannon at the fountain. It shoots an 80-foot arc across the 220-foot span of the river for 10 minutes at the top of the hour. The daily schedule is 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. for the fountain to go off, 10 minutes, and then 5 p.m. to 10 p.m. at night at the top of those hours. It will not go off at 3 or 4 in the afternoon, friends. That is rush hour in Chicago. Chicagoans are too notorious for Gaper's Block. We are known to park our cars and look at anything that interests us, even in the middle of moving traffic. Turn that fountain on at 3 in the afternoon, you'd stop traffic on Lakeshore Drive all the way to Evanston, Illinois. Some dreams die hard, friends. Tiny abandoned lot on our left was supposed to be five years ago the tallest building in the Western Hemisphere, the Chicago Spire. Spanish architect Santiago Calatrava had designed a beautiful spiraling design that would have reached 2,000 feet. We watched the developer drop 114 caissons in a 76 foot deep pit right here to support that building. And then we came to work one day and all the workmen had run away. There was nothing but empty space. It was the same as it ever was. And I said, wait a minute, this is not my beautiful skyscraper. This is not my Chicago Spire. What happened? Well, the developer ran out of dough. That's what happened. They basically had enough money to dig a big hole, but they had no more money to pay Mr. Calatrava. The architect had to file an $11 million lien for fees owed. That was pretty much the end of the story. And I'd like to thank David Byrne for helping me tell it. Now, just east of Lakeshore Drive, indeed the only skyscraper east of Lakeshore Drive in the area, is Lake Point Tower Condominiums. First curved glass skyscraper, tallest condo in the world in 1968. Shipwright and Heinrich Architects, inspired and designed by their teacher Mies van der idea for an off-glass tower in 1920s Berlin. Optimum lake views because of the glass curtain wall. The shallowness of the curve retains your privacy. The private club at the top is now a public restaurant called Cité. I forced myself to go up there and have a glass of wine on your behalf so I could come back and report. Okay, it's really high-end dining, high-end French dining, but the views are spectacular if you decide to have dinner up there. Finally, we are separated from the lake by the concrete retaining wall of the Chicago Locks. Erected in 1938 after every Great Lakes state and Canada sued Chicago for reversing the river and maybe allowing a fifth of the fresh water on the planet in liquid form to drain to the Gulf. The court gave us a number in barrels per day. We have to monitor it. It was a problem, so we fixed it, because we're Chicagoans, and that's what we do. And never was that Chicago attitude more evident than after that great Chicago fire, which, mythopoetically speaking, is still determining our character today. Imagine the day after the fire, a third of the city gone, 100,000 homeless, but the builders don't wait. They walk out amidst a devastation for a sign of hope. They look north, and the water tower appears before them unscathed, and they think, we will rebuild this city. And the unofficial motto for Chicago then becomes, I will. And the builders do. Do you realize they were rebuilding? in Chicago with embers burning at their feet. They picked up the trash, they carried it down here, and they threw that trash in the water. And I mean right here, because Lake Point Tower, 1968, is built on debris from the fire of 1871. The builders of Chicago seem to know that like the mythical Phoenix, the city of Chicago would rise from its own ashes. Now that's the city surrounding us today, and we're concluding our cruise. Thanks for coming out. My name is Kevin, your guide. I'll be waiting for you at the top of the ramp as you disembark to take questions. Don't forget to check out your boarding photos. If you like the tour, feel free to give us a shout out on TripAdvisor or Yelp.com. One final note, though. Chicago, an architectural gym, is home to its own musical style, the Chicago blues as well. So here's a little thing of my own called Architecture Blues. I'm going to Chicago, said the baby, don't you wanna go? 
I'm going to Chicago, said the baby, don't you want to go? But they had a great fire, but we're gonna rebuild, you know. Now they got a river, but the river she runs uphill. I said Chicago River, but the river she runs uphill. Well, let's go to the city where the motto is, I will, and I will. Oh man, where the fire and the fire almost took the town. I said the great Chicago fire, but she almost, she all burned down. Oh, but the people of Chicago, well, you're never gonna keep us down. I said the windy city, rusty heart of people can't keep us not when we are living in the most architecturally significant city on the face of this entire planet Earth. With all apologies of Florence, Rome, Paris, Prague, Vienna, New Delhi, Helsinki, London, Dublin, Auckland, Sydney, Antwerp, Amsterdam, Moscow, Warsaw, Bucharest, and Budapest, Athens, Tel Aviv, Istanbul, or Constantinople, Los Angeles for one or two buildings, Philadelphia, Baltimore, Boston, San Francisco, and New York City. All right. But you can't keep Chicagoans down. Folks, have fun in Chicago. I'll see you on the dollar.